you turn it over to Greg, and you have have the uh, floor for the next hour. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Um, uh, like like Ed said, we, we are working with uh, the uh, city of Dallas, and uh, there's about uh, two or three other cities in uh, in Texas that we're we're after right now. Uh, we've got about um, about uh, 55 uh, different uh, municipalities, counties. Uh, we mainly deal with, uh, with anything related with water, uh, sensor-related systems, and uh, uh, IoT-related systems. So information that's traveling from uh, two-way communications between uh, sensors, SCADA systems, and uh, um, analytic systems, basically. So. Uh, we, we do we do a lot of work uh, with uh, with cities. Cities are, are trying to get um, uh, up to speed in terms of trying to handle their infrastructure. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, just just a little bit uh, about uh, me. Uh, my background is uh, in uh, uh, data and statistics, so I'm a little bit biased. So if, if you hear me, if, you, if I start careening down uh, the, the statistics uh, path and uh, everybody's eyes start to glaze over, just uh, put your hand up, ask a question, until me to get back on track, and uh, I will do. Um, the, my, my background is, is actually in uh, really in database marketing. Uh, so uh, I've worked for a lot of big companies in Toronto, Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, and uh, what, what I've done is is used um, a lot of data to try and make sense out of uh, uh, things for, for operational purposes, for marketing purposes, and uh, what, what i found is, is basically data is a treasure trove, and it's a great uh, way to, uh, to, to make sense of things. Uh, I go, go back, dating myself a little bit, uh, around a loyalty program in Toronto, and, in uh, the, the 90s, and to give you an idea of, of how far we've come in, uh, in that period of time, uh, when I was running the loyalty program in Toronto, I used to say, you know, how, you know, how, many, how many customers do I have in, uh, in um, uh, New York State, or whatever the case might be, and uh, I'd send this off to my data warehousing company, and in two weeks, I, I would get uh, a number and a bill for $2,000, right? So it's for the... Uh, uh, back, back then, uh, the, the data management and the flow, the free flow of information to be able to make uh, decisions on things was was, was really, really cumbersome and, and, uh, and difficult. Uh, in the '90s, we saw the rise of the relational database management system through Oracle, Oracle and IBM and Microsoft, and uh, the rise of these um, uh, uh, relational database warehouse uh, management systems, and so. Uh, that, that was excellent. It was a, it was a revolution. It allowed uh, companies to get a hold of their information, actually make uh, smart, sort of near real time uh, uh, decisions if they're able to sort of capture all the data sources uh, uh, that, uh, that they came along. And, and then this, uh, this thing called the internet came along, right? So it, uh, and all of a sudden uh, we were being bombarded with all sorts of uh, unstructured data and uh, the sheer volume of the data that was actually coming in was uh, uh, overwhelmed. The, uh, the systems that, uh, that uh, just had been put in place and were so good at actually providing us with the answers. Um, so that was a real thorn in my side because as, as I moved from company to company and, and as I was trying to get uh, uh, better, better information, deeper insight on, on uh, what exactly was going on, uh, with these companies so I could uh, build models and, and uh, help the companies be more productive. Uh, I knew that there was a treasure trove, trove of information, but it was all in log files, and uh, nobody really knew how it was uh, structured, how it fit together, and, uh, and that was a real problem. Um, as the years progressed, I, I moved uh, back, uh, back to Canada, back to Vancouver, where I'm originally from. I started a couple of private companies, and uh, then about three and a half years ago, I started Carl Data Solutions. And the reason for that was uh, I saw that the, the technology had reached a stage uh, where um, there was platforms that could store any amount of data in any structure and type, and you didn't have to create a storage structure underlying it that that made sense out of the information. Rather, you could store it and then make sense out of it afterwards. And I thought, wow, this is this is a this is a perfect technology to, to build on, given the fact that at the same time the Internet of Things was actually coming into place, 
and uh, it was it was just generating more and more data. So I thought that we, we really had something to, to try and build a, you know, applications on to really help people understand uh, their data and uh, be, be much more efficient. Um, Current, current deployments, uh, you know, we, we work with engineering companies, uh, harbor manufacturers, uh, uh, and uh, city municipalities, um, also uh, mining companies, uh, some, some utilities. Uh, we work with lots of different people, basically anybody who has any connected devices uh, and, and wants to uh, aggregate information and then uh, make, make sense out of it. So, um, uh, the uh, a lot of a lot of deployments that we do, and I'll show you some examples. And that's really what I'm here to do is to show you a little bit about what what we're doing and some of the deployments we have. But uh, the the uh, any, anybody that, uh, uh, that that has uh, sensors or information coming in and they want to tie it to their uh, their control systems or do some modeling on it to try and make it uh, their their people more efficient. In, in doing their jobs, you know, that's that's really what what we do. Um, so I, I don't think I have to say to, to this group that uh, the, the Internet of Things, in our case, where our focus is the industrial Internet of Things. So so we uh, we don't do uh, consumer technology. We we, uh, we we just do industry and government. Uh, but there's a there's an explosion, and I don't really think. People are are uh, most people are aware of just how much uh, data that, that's actually being uh, connected. And so certainly, you know, a lot of people I heard some people from the from telcos in here. They they must have some idea of, of how these uh, these networks are being built, and uh, and how much uh, uh, data and how many of these uh, uh, things are being actually connected. So you've got. Uh, the networks, you've got the smart devices, and you've got uh, the, the, the applications or the controllers or the, the brains of the operation to make sense of this stuff. And uh, it, what it's doing is it's, it's really going to be changing uh, our lives, uh, moving forward, changing the way that uh, we do things. There's a, a lot of our clients in, in different uh, areas, uh, in particular in mining, for instance, that uh, uh, now employ hundreds if not thousands of people that want to be fully autonomous operations by about 2050. Uh, that requires a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of computing power, and uh, a lot of very, very smart devices to ensure that, uh, that, they can, that these things can actually do what, what currently uh, people do now. Uh, but as you, as you can probably imagine, it's going to really change uh, the, the landscape, the environment, and, and, uh, and our economies uh, when we, we move forward. And this is, uh, uh, this is happening right now. It's not um, uh, it's something that we have to, uh, that uh, it's theoretical at, at this point. It's actually happening right now. We're seeing it in the industry. We're seeing uh, we, we have about 12 different pilot projects out there that uh, with, with brand new tools using artificial intelligence to uh, basically do things uh, much more efficiently and faster. So um, uh, much faster than a human being can actually uh, sort of operate and much more efficient. Um, so the, uh, I'll get into uh, so some of the, uh, the, the examples. We, we, we're we're uh, limited to time series data analysis, so that, that's really what, what we work with. Uh, we, we work with uh, uh, anything with a time stamp we, we can put into our system, we can work with and we can, uh, we can help you uh, model, but uh, time series is really uh, where, where our, our, uh, our strength is. Um, our framework, and I won't get too detailed in here, there's some, some technology guys in here that, uh, that may understand some of this, but suffice this to say, it give you an, an, an idea of uh, just how, how deeply we're, we're involved in this. We're really an end-to-end -end solution provider, and the reason for that is, do we want to be an end-to-end -end solution provider? Not really, uh, but we, we, we find that we have to fill the gaps in some places because uh, the, there just are no companies that exist that, uh, that uh, uh, sometimes we go into a place and they say, hey, can you, uh, can you create uh, 
uh, this particular system and we find gaps and we find that uh, perhaps the, uh, the hardware provider does, does not have the, uh, the system in place or we, 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 uh, we see that the, the telcos don't exist or they don't have coverage in, in areas so we have to use uh, low power wide area networks using different uh, radio frequencies to supplement uh, what they have. Uh, the core, uh, the middle, the middle piece that you see with the the, uh, the, the frame around it is really um, our uh, our secret sauce. And and what what it is 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 a um, a great infrastructure for for collecting and processing information. So we have billions of rows of, of information coming in sort of every uh, 15 minutes from from uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of different. Uh, uh, sites and we have to actually collect that information uh, somehow and then we have to store that information and at, in real time we have to actually apply analytics to that information so the end users so that so if you look at the, the right hand side when we see the web apps the SCADA systems the enterprise systems we can actually deliver uh, the results to, to these people so what we're trying to do is, is get people away from uh, putting together, uh, mashing together and amalgamating all these different log files into Excel spreadsheets and then trying to figure out what the hell's going on. You know, and the, uh, uh, because that's easy, a recipe for disaster. You've got uh, human error, it's, it's static, it's, it's delayed, it's reactive. Uh, what we're trying to deliver is real-time solutions for people to, to uh, uh, help uh, protect the infrastructure, the environment, and, and, and people uh, in, in a, lot of, a lot of different respects. So, the um, I'll, I'll talk just just a little bit about machine learning because machine learning is actually critical uh, to, uh, to to what we do, and and the the reason for it is is that um, uh, well I, you know when when I'll go back uh, go back in time is to, to the 90s as well to talk about the way that uh, that I used to process data. Um, I, I used to from, from massive data sets have to extract sample sample sets of information, run statistical algorithms on the machine learning has nothing new. It's been around for a long long time, uh, but. The, uh, but you used to have to extract a sampling bit of information, run it through, and then figure out your results, and then apply it to, to a, a greater application or, or scheme or whatever the case is. Now, with, with the new technology that we actually have in place, uh, you can run the, these machine learning algorithms real time on uh, massive amounts of information that's actually coming through. So we have the computing power and we have uh, the, the correct uh, uh, storage uh, mechanisms to, to actually be able to do that. And, and that's, that's absolutely amazing. So it means that you can actually build in these algorithms, these really, really powerful uh, algorithms uh, uh, to, to your, your actual application. I'm sure everybody's heard about you know, um, uh, Watson and uh, the Google uh, application that uh, they can beat people at chess and, uh, and go and, and, and all the rest of these games and things like that. Well, that's, that's really just uh, a machine learning in action. Uh, so uh, uh, artificial intelligence, I guess, is, is a result of, uh, of machine learning and being able to harness that to, uh, uh, to, to have it run real time on, on massive amounts of data and come up with uh, very intelligent results and, and in, a, in, a, in a time that no human being could ever be able to process that amount of information. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. Um, the, the process, of course, in, in doing this does require a human being. <laughs> the, which, what you need to, uh, to do is uh, typically uh, start with a training set of data. Uh, you get a, a domain expert to actually look at that data, evaluate the information from the training set, and, and then uh, as that person says yes or no uh, to, to the information that uh, the algorithm is actually uh, predicting the, in, in the terms of the result set, uh, the algorithm gets, uh, gets better and better and better over time. So eventually that person that you see there is, is really eliminated because the, the algorithm essentially becomes smarter than the, uh, the, the person that's actually uh, helping to, to train it. Um, so th this is um, th this is a really really good in um, in uh, a lot of the fields that uh, that we work in because uh, th there's a lot of uh, a lot of engineers uh, a lot of people that, that love data analysts that spend 
90% of the time poring over data sets, uh, trying to, to eliminate bias in those data sets, looking for uh, problems that may affect uh, their, their, their models. Uh, machine learning is amazing at uh, pattern recognition, and what, what it can do is it can uh, uh, look at those data sets and, and it can figure out where, where the problems are and eliminate all those problems. So it's a 90% of your work sort of goes away and you can focus, the engineers kind of should focus on building the models that, uh, that you know, is really the job and presenting those models to, uh, to cities, companies, uh, whoever it is that, uh, that is, is looking for those results. So, I, I can't say enough about the machine learning and, uh, and how it fits in with uh, IoT, uh, our systems, our applications, and, and uh, uh, why this is uh, just a quantum leap forward in terms of applications in this area. <clears throat> uh, so problems to solve. What, uh, what, what exactly do, uh, are, are we looking at? So uh, I love to solve problems. I love uh, automation. Uh, uh, there's, there's lots of problems to solve and, and really uh, we're, we're on the, the environmental side of things and so uh, we're looking at oil spills, uh, uh, stresses in infrastructure, uh, flooding due to environmental events, uh, tailings ponds and things associated with uh, oil and gas and, and, uh, and mining uh, and severe, and severe storms and their, their effect on, on infrastructure as well. So there's lots of different ways that uh, you, you can incorporate these IoT uh, networks, devices uh, combined with uh, telemetry networks, and uh, of course the, the, the end applications to take all that information and uh, make sense out of it so, uh, so, so people can uh, do things and protect infrastructure and protect, uh, protect uh, people. Um, waste and stormwater management is, um, is, is really our strong spot. That's where about 80% of our, our revenue actually comes from right now. Excuse me. The um, <clears throat> reason for that is, is, is listed here. Uh, in, in cities, uh, a lot of cities in North America, and we, we have a bit of a toehold in, uh, in uh, the UK, but, uh, but mainly we're in North America. Uh, but uh, the, we, we have an aging infrastructure in cities, and it's a constant battle to actually keep this, uh, this infrastructure up and, and, and actually running. Uh, so it's projected that about a trillion dollars needs to actually go into infrastructure upgrades in North America uh, uh, over, over the next little while. So the, you just, this is just the United States, actually. Um, you can consider, consider a city like Dallas, or uh, Dallas is a client of ours, that. Uh, has uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles of uh, pipes uh, underneath the, the, the city. You know, once, once, you, once you lay those, uh, those pipes, of course they, they operate at 100% capacity, uh, then as soon as you, you put dirt over them and walk away, they start to degrade. And uh, well, what happens is the ground shifts, or, or uh, there's cracks or imperfections in, in the actual pipes, and, and over time, uh, uh, groundwater and sediment uh, either from from the ground or um, or uh, from things being flushed down the toilet or <laughs> or uh, grease from uh, uh, from, uh, from restaurants, all sorts of things get into those pipes and degrade them uh, over time. So so they go from 100% capacity down to down to 50% capacity, and of course with a, an expanding uh, population base and more. Uh, uh, more need for capacity of those pipe pipes to actually uh, handle that expanding uh, base, it, it becomes a real, real problem uh, because uh, your your uh, your system's not working very well. So, uh, what, one of the things that uh, that uh, all cities have to some degree uh, is uh, something called combined sewage overflow and uh, even more sinister uh, sanitary sewer overflow. Um, what, what, what happens in, in a lot of cases is that uh, once these, these pipes get, uh, get clogged uh, and you have something like a, a big rainstorm or whatever the case is, uh, that, that stuff in the pipes has to go somewhere. <laughs> and uh, uh, typically where, where it ends up is, uh, is either in lakes, rivers, oceans, 
uh, whatever the case is, or uh, unfortunately up into people's basements, which is a, which is a terrible problem in, in a lot of cities. The, uh, the, the big problem that, uh, that, that cities have right now is that, well, they've got a couple of problems. First, first of all, they have unhappy uh, citizens because uh, uh, nobody wants uh, raw sewage backing up in their basement. And, uh, uh, but the se second problem is, is they have uh, their, their capital expenditure projects they have to prioritize and they have to look at and see uh, where the biggest need is to actually dig these things up and, and actually replace them. Um, the, the other thing is they have the, the um, uh, in, in this slide uh, show, shows our, our application, one of the tools that, uh, that we offer, which is a predictive analytics tool, is, is uh, to help uh, field teams actually go out and, and uh, uh, give them advance warning on exactly where we feel that these events are going to occur. Are going to occur. So, so the reason why we're able to do this is, is really um, uh, IoT. So, so the, we have uh, sensors and devices collect, uh, connected to, uh, to networks that send the information uh, through into the cloud and into our application. We, we overlay uh, all that, uh, that information that's coming in with uh, historical data, uh, weather models, and information from SCADA systems and our algorithms uh, come up with uh, predictions on exactly what's going to happen and where there's going to be problem spots. So, so in our application, which looks uh, pretty much exactly like this, uh, the cities are, are able to actually see in advance where, where they're going to have problems. And this helps them position uh, crews. It, it also helps them uh, actually notify uh, the public, which in certain places in the United States, uh, they, they have to, according to EPA regulations, they have to tell people that uh, you you can't go swimming here uh, because of high E. coli counts or, or something like that. Uh, so so it, it uh, really helps them manage the system. Uh, prior to to uh, this kind of system being deployed, I think we we're the we we're the first ones that, that that have deployed a system like this using machine learning and advanced analytics to actually give you the predictive uh, side of things. It it, uh, it didn't exist before. Yeah. Uh, Greg, what do you use for the weather forecast? Some of the private services like the AccuWeather to run meters. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we've got um, we subscribe to about um, a dozen different weather models, and so uh, there's there's lots of different algorithms that so that you can use. And um, uh, the reason why we, we subscribe to so many is is because uh, some work better in, in, in different places, but uh, more often more interesting is that uh, what what you can do is is you can. Uh, apply all the models, and the algorithm will, will go through all the models. And and uh, if if only one model says you're going to have a problem, well, you know you, you might want to dig down on that and, and be a little bit uh, interested in it. It's when all the models tell you that there's going to be a problem that it's, uh, it's you you have a great degree of certainty that uh, uh, that you better be sending a, a crew out to to fix the problem. So, so yes, we, we do. We do uh, subscribe to a bunch of weather models. We also have uh, uh, government data sets from uh, from uh, weather stations and, and other places where they, they collect information uh, to 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 overlay on top of the stuff. So we collect data from we're voracious consumers of, of data that we put into the system. So, as the more data we have, the better the better models that we can actually give people. The better. Uh, suggestions that we can actually give uh, uh, people to, to better manage their systems. Yeah. What type of sensors are you using in your sewer pipes, and how are you powering them when they're underneath the road? So, so yeah. So, so the um, uh, sensors and pipes is, is nothing new. Usually, there's, there's mechanical sensors, but they come a, a long way. Uh, used to be that uh, they they would uh, uh, do static studies. And uh, so somebody would bury uh, uh, put into a pipe an actual mechanical meter that measured, that measured volume and flow and, and, and all the rest of these things, and then they'd have a uh, uh, they'd go and they, they'd measure it, and somebody would go and pick it up, pick up the data, add it to a whole bunch of uh, uh, more data logs, and, and then somebody would put together a report and then deliver it on somebody's desk at, at some point or whatever the case is. They've now moved, uh, most of the hardware vendors now have uh, 
the ability to, to put in um, uh, transceivers that connect to, uh, to cell networks. And that allows them to get uh, sort of near real time information actually flowing into the system. So, so you know, I would say 90% of, uh, of the cities uh, use that kind of a system where they have uh, these, these uh, cell contracts, they have the, uh, the mechanical meter set up, and the information actually flowing up into uh, cell network and then into the cloud from there and into, into our system. What type of data? I mean, does it flow or...? Flow, or? volume, pressure, uh, lots of different things. And it, it could range from, from, uh, from place to place. But uh, the, in, our, in, in our system, we have full GIS data so we can see uh, exactly what the stresses are on, on the different uh, pipes. So, so, you know, you look at a uh, pipe that uh, theoretically should be able to handle a certain amount of, uh, of water, but it's, it's not because you know upstream how much water is, is actually coming into that pipe and for some reason uh, the, the, the water level is higher and the pressure is higher and so there's something wrong with, with that pipe and that's how you determine that. I'll show you, sort of show you that, uh, that next. So we not only have uh, the, the, uh, the warning system uh, for that, but we also developed uh, a system based on based on those the sensors that you're talking about that are that are buried and then put into these actual pipes to, to measure the, the information, and and uh, uh, what we do is we, we take into account all these different uh, sensors. We put them through uh, an algorithm and we dynamically tell people exactly where the problem points actually are. So th this is a, this is a great way of uh, I was talking about the. Uh, engineers before that used to go out and sort of put these things into different places, go out and collect the data, write a big long report, and, and throw it on somebody's desk. Now, the, the problem with that that is, is again, you, you throw the report on somebody's desk and it's, and it's, uh, it's outdated, it's, it's old as soon as you put it on the desk. This, this particular system that, uh, that, that you're looking at now is updated in most cases for, for most cities every 15 minutes. So, so the entire model, the entire hydraulic model for, uh, for, for the city and the wastewater and stormwater systems is, is uh, readjusted and rejigged every, every 15 minutes. So you have a dynamic understanding of exactly how well your, your system is actually operating. So in, in, this, in this particular case, this is a, um, this is, this is either uh, Toronto or Atlanta, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, the, you, you can see that, that one of these catchment areas is, is having real problems handling the, uh, the flow of, uh, of the storm and wastewater. And, and what, what that means is that uh, uh, to, to the city engineers, is they better pay attention to that because they either have to go to send somebody in there to have a look at uh, what the problem is, clean it up, or uh, decide that this is the number one priority for the next uh, CapEx project to get in there and actually replace the, uh, the infrastructure in that area. Yeah. Is, there, is there an ability to divert, divert the water automatically with these systems? I'll take the pressure off for right now. So in, in, in some places, in some places. So, so the funny thing about it is the, uh, uh, the uh, early warning uh, system that, that, that I showed you. Uh, it's an amazing system, and the, crew, the crews in the field really, really, really want it. They think, they think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, we, we've actually had some comments from cities saying, whoa, 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 that, that'll increase our liability because we'll know beforehand, and there's nothing we can do about it, <laughs> which, which is a, a terrible situation to, to be in. But uh, yes, th there, is, uh, there is a lot of cities where they, they have pump stations and uh, uh, they can actually divert uh, the, the water and take the pressure off of these, these different areas in advance to, to avoid some of these situations. So, so you know, the bottom line is, is what we're trying to do is give them the information so, so uh, uh, they, can, they can avoid uh, having raw sewage back up in the people's basements and things like that. But uh, cities are, are, are still trying to catch up and, and, uh, and, and like I said, uh, the, uh, whereas uh, some parts of the city engineering group I think this is the most amazing thing so that they know where to go and where to be in order to clean up the mess, uh, the, uh, uh, the higher-ups are, are uh, scratching their heads and, and talking to the, the lawyers about 
uh, increased liability because uh, they'll know beforehand when, when there's going to be a problem, <laughs> which could put them in a pretty awkward situation. So, so uh, there's a bit of, bit of catch up uh, that, uh, that, that a lot of places have to, to, uh, to do, but overall, uh, we believe that this type of system is going to be in place uh, all, all over the place. It just uh, uh, has to, yes. Uh, I have a question. So, are you responsible for the sensors, or is the city placing these sensors and you, get, you pay to get access to the data? Uh, how does it work? In, in, uh, for, for the, the city, I'll, I'll get into a couple more examples, but uh, for, for this, this instance, Yes, we, we work with uh, hardware companies and engineering companies. They're the ones that supply the, uh, uh, the sensors, and they're the ones we, we deal with for the management piece in terms of understanding the, the information and building it into our applications. So we, we work with uh, um, uh, multiple different companies. So the RFP typically involves uh, uh, a main, uh, a main uh, uh, person who, who leads it. It's typically an engineering company. They hire hardware vendors, and in the case of us, a software or application vendor to, to really wrap things all up so, so, you know, so people make sense of it. I think there's another question, yeah. Yeah, how granular, how granular does your tool get? Uh, is it, you know, lights, lights yellow or red, or is it... Uh, uh, that's a, that's you know, a great... A break, yeah. there's an actual, you know, flow problem, or... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great question, and and the uh, the the answer is you know, because you th you think of the city uh, and the infrastructure that the the levels different levels in the city. Uh, some people just want to have a look at the map on their phone. So so Los Angeles is is a is a is a, a client for instance, and we got we got a lot of people in Los Angeles that only look at our application on the phone because they want to look at the GIS layer to see ex exactly. Uh, where, where the problems are, so so they're you know if they're if they're called in to by you know, the political class to to uh, to answer for something they know what, what's what's going on. Uh, then you have uh, the the guys in the field who uh, we have a uh, notification system that uh, that texts them or emails them or actually even calls them and uh, lets them know where, where the, uh, the problems are and they may only look at uh, a one layer of, of the dashboard as well. But the, uh, the the city analysts and the people that are actually doing the modeling to try and figure out how to better uh, increase the capacity of their system can drill right down into the raw data. So, so we have right down into the uh, uh, you know the, the the numbers and the raw data. So you can look at uh, graphing. You can look at uh, uh, you can build all sorts of uh, calculated uh, channels based on that information. And set thresholds and and, uh, and build models and then present that to uh, the powers that be to request a capex funding for projects. But but your lowest common denominator would be there's a flow problem, or would you say there's a break, or there's a clog, or you right? I mean, how how low do you go? Yeah, yeah. And so, so lowest common denominator is is, is yeah you got a problem. Yeah, this is broken. Uh, this this is flooding. This is overflowing, or it's. Uh, uh, not recording, but you can't say exactly what it is. You just have to say that there's a problem. No, but we, we can we can typically say what it is. So we can say it's an overflow issue. We can say it's a um, uh, it's, it's a meter that's not working. We can we can say that it's a complete blockage. There's no flow. Um, there, there's, there's all sorts of things that we can program into the system. So we, we collect we collect all the raw granular data, every, everything right from everything that uh, the sensors can, can collect, and and uh, and from that though we, we can build all sorts of, of different uh, uh, calculated channels to, to, to figure out and give give you the advance warning that you need to, to make more sense out of the information. So for instance, you might want to string together uh, three or four different sites and, uh, and say, look, you know, if uh, this site gets to this level, we know that eventually these two sites are going to be affected, so, you know, raise the alarm when, when, when this happens over here so somebody can go to this site and, and, uh, and be ready for it. So, so that there's, there's all sorts of neat things that, that you can actually do. Uh, with the information in the application, and but but you, looking at you're right, looking at the application, it, it's built so that it's, it's multi-tier. Uh, so the people that really want to get down to the, the granular stuff and, and really crunch the numbers to try and figure out what's going on can do that. 
um, the, uh, the higher ups, the, their supervisors can, can look at it at a glance and, and figure out uh, what's going on by looking at the GIS layer. And, uh, and then the, uh, the, the people in the field as well can, can look at a different angle, a different aspect of it to, to figure out uh, where they need to be and what they need to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and from a marketing perspective for a municipality to spend money on a project like this, do they normally have to have some sort of qualifying event that gets them interested? Because this isn't going to be something that's normally budgeted. You know, this is going to be like a new concept for them. So what is it that gets them over the hump that says, hey, man, we need to do this, besides a qualifying event that obviously causes a lot of litigation problems? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think uh, um, that's a really good question. You know, I, I, a lot of people would argue that we were on the bleeding edge when, when we started, and, right. and uh, a lot of cities were saying, mm, that, that's, that's interesting, uh, but uh, uh, we, we don't really need it now. Um, uh, the, there's, uh, um, uh, there's been a big change, though, in, in, the, in, the, in a shift in, in the way that people are, are looking at these things. And, and that's brought on about by, by things happening in IoT. So, so you know, if, if, uh, if uh, my, my refrigerator knows when I need eggs and I get a, <laughs> and a text on my phone that, uh, that, that says, hey, on, on your way home, this is your refrigerator, pick up six eggs, or whatever the case is. Uh, the cities are starting to say, well, you know, maybe we should be a little bit brighter in terms of uh, our operations as well, uh, because the technology does exist to be able to allow us to, to figure out where the problems are and how, how to fix them. And, and that's where, where we come in. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of uh, large municipalities have risk management groups that come up with plans like this, but even if a, not that particular town gets hit, but a local one, it's like, well, that could happen to us too. Then they take a harder look at those risk management. They, they, they really do. Uh, cities, cities get together, and and uh, the ones that are, are really hard hit uh, by events, and, and typically it's the cities with, with the crumbling infrastructure that uh, you know all of a sudden uh, they're hit with with a, with a massive problem that they have to throw a lot of money at. And, and uh, uh, they weren't ready for it. You know, of course, the people in, in, the, in the, the city are saying, uh, how on earth did you, did you not know about this? Uh, you know, this is, this is something that uh, uh, must have been uh, in the making for 100 years. And so so why, why aren't you keeping track of this? And, and uh, that's why we're getting the adoption that we're getting, and, and it's coming in uh, fast. The, the other thing is, is which is great, is that uh, the cities are now uh, really putting in this to, to the RFPs that they're sending out to the engineering firms and um, and the hardware vendors. They're saying, okay, it's great that you're collecting the data, it's great that you're writing these reports, but we need some insight into actually what's happening in these systems. So if we're going to buy all these, these sensors, and these sensors are going to be reporting all this information back, or whatever the case is, we need some sort of catcher's bed to, to aggregate all this information, uh, integrate it with, with our control systems, so we have a better understanding of what's happening with, with, within our system. And uh, that, in, in a lot of cases, in most cities, actually doesn't exist uh, right, right now, so they're operating a little bit blind. And uh, uh, in, in a lot of, for, for cities, it, it's, uh, it's typically a, it's a hassle for the people that live in those cities, because they have, uh, uh, all of a sudden, a problem pops up, and, and it's a massive thing that they have to deal with. They, they, they way overpay for for the fix because uh, because it's a, a last minute thing; it wasn't planned for, uh, and and uh, uh, you know people get upset. And so so th this is just something that it, it seems like an obvious solution uh, for for a lot of people these days. Yeah. Great. Could this system be used for natural gas lines, and oil pipelines, also? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, in Dallas, the last couple of years, we've seen uh, even one very tragic explosion where a young girl lost her life. Yeah, I'll, um, well, I, I'll talk about uh, mining because, because it, has, it has the same, the same uh, impact. And, and the, uh, what, what happens, and I'm sure people have uh, heard about um, um, some of the disasters that, that have happened uh, uh, over over the last little while. So we've had so big mines in countries like Brazil and Canada, 
uh, and, and other places uh, have had, uh, you know, they, 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 they open pit mines, they uh, use a lot of water, uh, a, lot, a lot of the, the extract from, from the stuff that the, they're pulling out of the ground uh, ends up in tailings ponds. There's a lot of heavy metals and, and, and things, uh, things that uh, are very, very toxic that ends up in, in tailings ponds. In uh, British Columbia, for, for example, where, where I'm based, uh, we, we have a, we have a lot of these uh, uh, these tailings ponds. Actually, go, go, uh, well, the first slide that I, sh I showed you um, is, uh, is is a coal operation, and they have two tailings ponds, and they're 13 kilometers long. They're 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 they're, they're very very long, um, several miles, and uh, uh, and they're deep, and and they they're they, these these ponds run right alongside a river. And so, and so, so what happens is, is uh, um, and, and they're, they're, they're in valleys with high mountains on, on either side. So, so picture snow on the mountains, uh, a big tailing spawn because they're operating, trying to operate at 100% capacity. So the, the, the water's flowing, they're trying to get the operation done. And then they have a, an event, typically in the spring, where there's a high snow melt, high temperature, uh, watershed ground saturation is, is at 100%, and then in seven days there's going to be a high precipitation event. They're in danger of losing their, their, uh, their tailings pond. If that tailings pond breaks, uh, all the, those heavy metals, all those toxins, everything flows into the river, uh, and, and that amount of water can wipe out an entire, entire uh, uh, municipality, cities, and, and in, in the case of British Columbia, a lot of uh, uh, First Nations uh, uh, communities, and uh, uh, if if that happens uh, as well, the the uh, heavy metals and the toxins in those tailing ponds can completely wipe out a, an ecosystem for hundreds of years uh, because that's how bad the stuff is in there and how toxic it, it is. So so we we've developed a, a system, an early warning system, to let them uh, know, to let mines know. Uh, when uh, these these uh, perfect set of circumstances may actually occur, so they can move and the equipment around and actually shore up areas of, of the uh, of the tailings pond where we think that uh, a breach might be likely. Uh, so so the, these don't happen uh, often, but the uh, uh, when when they do, uh, we can uh, we can actually let's slide on down here. Yeah, okay, when they, they do, we can actually uh, let them know in advance, uh, up to seven days in advance, uh, when they have to do something. Now, typically in the past, it was, it was actually quite kind of shocking to us uh, how, how lines are operated. Uh, the, in, you know, they, they used to look at the weather forecast and uh, uh, look, look at uh, the data that they had on hand, mash together a whole bunch of spreadsheets, and then sort of white knuckle it through uh, through certain periods, and, and uh, it was kind of shocking. And, and what what we did was uh, we, we came in, uh, we worked with a company called Tech Resources, uh, based uh, based with BC, but a big you know multi billion dollar uh, mining company, and uh, we we created an automated system for them with an algorithm that looked at. A uh, whole bunch of different weather models, data sets, uh, sensors uh, uh, coming, you know, information from sensors that are coming in real time. And uh, we, we created a system for them that uh, gave them an early warning as to when there might be an actual problem. So, so this, this is uh, what they would see if, uh, if we, we expected an issue. So you can see the last, the last uh, uh, bar chart on there is basically uh, you're screwed, <laughs> and, and and the uh, the the slide that I had uh, before that, I'll just talk about. This, there's billions and billions and billions of dollars in unsecured liabilities because a lot of these things, uh, their insurance companies aren't going to cover. Uh, so so you know a huge huge mining company that uh, that uh, uh, completely destroys an ecosystem and kills people because the tailing spawn breaks. Is out of business. And so, and we've we've seen this in uh, in, in Brazil, where where uh, uh, Australian and, and uh, Brazilian uh, uh, cooperative ventures that uh, people have gone to jail and they've simply gone out of business. These massive companies, uh, just simply because they they, uh, they they couldn't keep track of the environmental conditions. 
that uh, that led to the collapse of, of these uh, these tailing spawns. So so the, these are the kinds of products that we're, we're actually putting in place and trying to help people in this area. Yeah. So it seems like the, the purpose is to have a solution for the, you don't want to push it to the limit, right? So does that do they look? Can they use the data and say, oh, we shouldn't be uh, managing the ponds so with so much uh, poisonous water or whatever? Run it at a lower level. Have something. you ever seen a mine slow down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do see we do see the mines slow down, but the the most interesting part about this is that. Um, this this project wasn't kicked off because of risk mitigation or a massive concern about uh, um, the uh, uh, the tailings pond breaking, and, and it was actually kicked off as a as, as a productivity venture because what, what they were doing is they were getting too many false positives from from the data analysts, and, and every time we got a false positive, uh, they'd have to stop production, move everybody around, and that would cost them. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars because because you know they stopped production, so they, they wanted to remove as many of these false positives as, as, as they possibly could. So it was it was actually brought about. You know, I, I'm, I'm talking about all, all the things that we would think are completely obvious, but <laughs> to, to a mining company, it, it's actually a, a productivity tool because it, it increases overall productivity by decreasing the number of false positives, which is interesting. Uh, but but it's uh, yeah, I like to think of it uh, from from the other perspective in terms of risk mitigation and uh, saving human lives. Yeah. <laughs> it's a side effect, not yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good side effect. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's uh, it, it's a it's a great product, and and like, like I said, without without the uh, uh, the devices in the field, the smart devices in the field, that are able to collect and send the information. Through the, through the networks that, uh, that that are set up and uh, connected to to the cloud, so that whole IoT uh, system that uh, that uh, that's set up, uh, they, we wouldn't be able to do that. It just simply wouldn't be possible. So, uh, and, and and this this wasn't possible uh, in, in uh, just five years ago. So it, it's uh, it's brand new stuff. Um, so we, we've talked about that. Uh, I'll get into oil and gas pipelines because that was the the, uh, the question. So um, pipeline pipelines are, are a particular pet peeve of mine because it, you know I, I don't like to see oil spilling out into rivers and uh, and uh, onto farmers' fields and having the the oil companies uh, that are monitoring these things uh, sitting in their control centers, hearing alarms going off, but scratching their heads and, and wondering what the hell to do. And that's what's happening. So, so you have uh, you think about the uh, the Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan uh, oil spill, and that in uh, uh, that was uh, about, about five years ago now. And uh, uh, Enbridge was the uh, um, fortunately I'm going to talk about two Canadian companies, but uh, the, <laughs> the Enbridge was the company involved in that, and uh, they they knew there was a drastic uh, drop in in pressure. And the alarms were going off, and the control systems were saying there's a problem, uh, but they had no idea where it was. And, and uh, so, you know, what, what do they do? So they, they're they're freaking out. In the end, uh, it was a uh, a farmer looking at a pipe, looking at oil bubbling out of the ground and going into the river, who actually called the the uh, the, the police station, the fire station, locally. Uh, and, and that's how it, it sort of bubbled up to the actual Enbridge, the company that's responsible for it. And that's how they found out where, where the actual location was when, when they were losing all this pressure and the oil, the oil was leaking. That, that's really horrible. shocking. It is shocking. Because I, yeah. I think the general assumption would be that a company whose business is running pipelines would have that thing so heavily censored that they would go anything, any time. Well, they're, and, and, and here's the thing. They're, they're operating from a different, uh, a, a different mentality, and, and the way that they 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 look at the pipelines is they send these things called pigs through the pipelines. I'm sure we're in we're in Texas. Everybody knows about these things, right? And and, and the, the pigs sort of take measurements as they go down through the pipelines and stuff. And they they collect all that information, and that's how they figure out, you know, how how the the thing is performing. Uh, we, we, we take a slightly different approach and we say uh, that's not the best idea uh, because what, what you really need to do is uh, string sensors 
uh, and build a network uh, to connect all the sensors together to collect the, the, the data in actual real time at all these, these, these strategic spots throughout the actual uh, pipeline and then have uh, an analytics reporting system to tell you exactly what, what's going on. Is there ground movement? Is there uh, potentially a 50-year uh, storm event that's going to flood uh, a river or a creek that may put uh, pressure on 100-year-old uh, abutments that, that, uh, that uh, the, the pipe goes over and that stream crossing? It's going to potentially cause a problem. These are the things that, that they really need to look at. So, so this this one in particular, you know, really uh, catches my eye. This is this is something that happened in, in Saskatchewan, and uh, uh, I get once again in this in this scenario, uh, uh, the uh, the the actually in this scenario they, they were not even. Uh, uh, sure that the pipe was leaking, <laughs> but well, once again a farmer called them up and said that hey, you know, the, the river's being uh, uh, destroyed by, by oil from your pipeline. And, and what, what had happened was, uh, was the, uh, the ground shifted. Now we, we can easily, uh, the ground typically shifts around certain areas, rivers in particular because of the environmental forces. Uh, we, we can put piezometers, we can put uh, all sorts of different sensors. We can connect them to, uh, to, to networks, uh, low power networks or cell, if there's telcos in the area, and we can have that data come into the cloud, and we can tell them in, in advance when we think there's gonna be an actual problem, or if, if, we, if we miss it with the algorithm, we can tell them exactly uh, when there is a problem, and exactly where that problem is. So, so they don't have to have farmers and fields calling up the, the, uh, the police department and saying, hey, <laughs> <laughs> there's there's, there's, there's little bubbling up from my field. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, of, one of the problems they overlook is just by putting in a pipeline, they change the natural infrastructure in that area. Mm -hmm. So that river may not have shifted for the last hundred years, but by putting a pipeline in there, they're setting the stage for it to start to shift. Down yeah. in Florida, um, they're building all these communities and they're seeing sinkholes where they didn't used to see sinkholes because they're putting. <laughs> Uh, plumbing systems and sewers and places, and they're changing the natural drainage of that. Yeah, well, we're we're picking up a lot of communities in Florida, uh, exactly because of that. The, and 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 the and that that's a great example of real time versus static reporting. It, it, with with uh, with IIoT, uh, there's there's no reason why you you wouldn't have real time reporting because you don't know when one of those sinkholes sinkle is going to happen. And, and so, so your, your model changes all the time. And, and, and what, the, what this does is having these, uh, these low cost uh, sensors in place and, and all that information flowing up, you have that dashboard that you can look at and you can see exactly what's happening in real time. And, and, and that's something we can deliver now. And, and it's, uh, it's very exciting. So yeah, Florida is, is a perfect example of that because they have, they have, well, they have a lot of problems, right? They have, uh, uh, rising water levels, they have uh, they have the sinkholes, and they have uh, uh, population expansion, and they have they have aging infrastructure. So so they've, they've got uh, sort of uh, you know a perfect storm. Uh, you, you might say <laughs> that that, uh, that that again uh, is really in need of uh, a monitoring system that, that lets them know in real time what exactly what's going on, and if, if they if they go one step further, it helps them predict. Uh, where they're going to have uh, the, these issues, and, and you know, the prediction is that we, we can put in place using this machine learning, these machine learning algorithms. Yes. I have a question. Since I moved from Florida a couple of years ago, what kind of sensors did you put for that sinkhole problem? Because there was one that opened up right near my office. Yeah, the, with, with the uh, with, with the sinkholes, we, we we haven't put anything in place, any system in place for that. So it's typically all all the the sensors that we manage are attached to the actual pipes. So what we can do is, is measure the uh, pressure of the strain on the actual pipe. We, we can look at if, uh, if there's a, a reduction in capacity in terms of what that pipe can actually uh, can accommodate. But uh, the, the opportunity exists if, if, uh, if, if people take it to, to put in I mentioned piezometers, for instance, and, and piezometers measure uh, ground movement. Uh, so, so if if it was me, uh, I, I would uh, I would 
you know, pretty much flood the area with thousands of these piezometers, all reporting up into a network, into a system, so I could see exactly where the movement was in the ground, and that should be able to give me an early warning of when, when the next sinkhole is going to actually occur, or where, where it's going to actually occur, with, with a pretty high degree of probability. Yeah? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, as far as remote sensing, the gap really is coverage. Like, for example, oil and gas out from the base from West Texas, there's hardly any uh, cell coverage, and, and you know, there's not a lot of lore on six sick box. Yeah. Still, yeah, yeah. Part two of that is getting power to those sensing devices. So right now, um, a lot of sensors are being deployed in remote areas uh, via battery power. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the companies that support those devices, they want you know, see these uh, sensors to have a, a lifetime of about one or two years. It's, you know, as soon as, soon as the you know, battery technology improves, then you know, that could be achievable. But the reality of it is, you know, there's still gaps in the coverage and some of the tech battery technologies to provide you real-time yeah. um, data to do the analytics you're, you're talking about. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and the, uh, but, but the technology is getting very, very good, a lot better, and a lot less expensive. So, for instance, we're doing a, uh, a project down in in uh, Chile for, for a mine. And, um, this is an air quality sensor, so the uh, the mine itself is actually very, very close to, to uh, a city. And uh, what it, it's an open uh, pit uh, pit mine, and so what they do is they, they blow things up. There's lots of explosions. And what, what these explosions do is they uh, release a lot of gases and, and they also release uh, uh, a lot of particulate matter into the air. And, and when, when it gets too high and, and the wind is right, it flows right into the population center. So, so uh, to, to mitigate the problem, uh, what they do is they have the, uh, this, this whole array of, of, uh, of water uh, big high pressure water uh, systems that spray into the air and, and, and force the gases to dissipate and force the particulate matter down on the ground. Now, what they're doing right now in terms of uh, managing this system and figuring out when to turn it on and when to turn it off is uh, the, the guy in the control center looks out the window and says, uh, okay, <laughs> Looks a little foggy out there. Better turn on the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so what <laughs> what we're doing is, is we're putting in place uh, uh, sensors uh, low to the ground and, and, and high above, and, and we're uh, we're, we're measuring the particulate matter and, uh, and and the different gas levels. We're setting it up because there is the, no cell coverage in the area. We're setting it up using a lower network and uh, so low power network. And, and the, uh, the the batteries that uh, that we have associated with the, these air quality sensors and the LoRa network are designed to last five years. So so there's a very very long uh, longevity. And then uh, in this particular area, sometimes you can use lithium and and, uh, and solar charging. As uh, in this particular area, you can't be because of the the explosions and things that, that actually occur. And also it's high up, and, and lithium batteries don't like cold. Uh, so, so, but, but, but a lot of the, um, a lot of the other battery types, and, and I should say, and this is really, really important, the, uh, uh, the, the microprocessors that actually go in and actually uh, tell the sensors to wake up, go to sleep, and, and, and all the rest of the stuff. The, there's, there's a new, uh, there's new firmware programming language that is so lightweight that it, it uh, doesn't use up a lot of power. So it doubles or triples the. Uh, the, the the time that, uh, that it, between battery changes basically so whereas you, you may have had to have changed the battery once a year in, in some of these cases our prediction for for the devices that we're, we're creating actually putting in in this particular mine is five years five years is, is, is pretty good uh, so so I, I think uh, uh, and they're um, uh, they're very happy with that. So, so we're the pilot project's going in next uh, next month, and we'll run it for a few months, and then do do a much larger deployment in that particular location, hopefully in in, a, in you know a dozen others as well. Yep. In terms of the models, I mean, you're dealing with some you know risk. You're helping prevent a very risky stuff. So, I guess um, the question would be. 
I know you bring in experts to prove it. Do you have to kind of, does that carry over pretty seamlessly to each location? Or how do you, um, you know, I'm, I'm still learning about machine learning, et cetera. Kind of how do you make sure it's accurate, you know, for that particular, uh, like this particular instance? Yeah. And then as you carry it to other cities, do you have to retrain the model on that particular topography or whatnot? Or is it pretty, you know, pretty similar across multiple locations? Does that make sense? Yes, it, it, it does, it does. And, and there's, there's a couple, a couple of different ways to, to, to answer that. Uh, 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 machine learning is excellent if, if it has a ton of data to work with. Uh, so, so if you have a ton of data and you have, you bring in a couple of domain experts in, in terms of understanding uh, the results so they can properly train the data, um, you, you're not going to have a problem. Machine learning is going to be excellent for you. It's going to figure out the, those variations that, that you talked about uh, on, on its own because but that's only if you have a lot of data. If, if you don't have a lot of data, machine learning can be useless, uh, and it can give you uh, false false results and uh, uh, and, and misguide you. So, so you really, really need. Uh, we we are a uh, software technology development company. We we don't pretend to be um, uh, engineers and, uh, and people that work in in these places. So when we do a deployment, we work very very closely with. The, uh, uh, those domain experts in that area, the engineering company, for instance, is hired by the city to actually figure this stuff out. And then typically we run our system in parallel with whatever they're doing, if they're doing anything, and, and we, we make sure that those results are validated before we deploy the actual system. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of testing that goes on, and that, that's for a couple reasons. First of all, the stuff is brand new. So, so you know, for instance, in the case of the, the uh, uh, flood forecaster to protect the tailings ponds uh, um, in, in in the BC mine. We have it deployed in three uh, BC mines now, and the uh, we ran that for nine months before the mining company finally said, "Yeah, you're better than us. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take you on." But but uh, it, so so it's a couple of different things. So, you know, it's the domain expertise. Uh, our access and availability to people that actually know and can validate uh, our, our models, and it's also access to data. Uh, we, we need uh, uh, lots of historical data, we need lots of information coming in from a lot of different sources, and that way we can provide much better uh, results. So, so our partners, the hardware vendors, uh, the guys that provide the telemetry or the, the, you know, the telcos and the solutions to get the information from the sensors up into the cloud, into our system, are very, very important. We're, we're, because the, the more data we have, the better, the better information, the better models we can create to, for people because we're confident in, uh, in our back end and our ability to actually use machine learning and these algorithms to be able to deliver uh, the, these really, really good uh, uh, products. Yeah? i got a question. So on that note, it was interesting. So, so do you monitor those actual NOx or those monitoring platforms to centralize that data? Yes. And then, so do you offer that as a service then as well? Or yes, do you yeah. Is that go to the EPA yeah. and go, hey, we're... We go, we go one step further. We, we, actually, we actually not only pull in all that, that sensor information and everything that's, uh, that's out there, we also can pull in all of the control system information from a dozen different control uh, systems and overlay that on top of the information so we have one source. So the algorithm's okay. learning from the algorithm that creates another algorithm? Well, the, 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 typically it's only, it's only one algorithm, but, uh, but the, the, the expertise, the guys that, uh, uh, that uh, actually handle the data tell us what they think is important. And that, that's how we start, right? And then, and then they, uh, so, so we, you know, you may have 150 different variables and we come in and we say, no, it's actually only 25 that will, will give us the information we actually need. And, and that's, that's uh, they, they, and that can come from a variety of sources, not just the sensors in the field that are going up, you know, into some sort of low power network or cell network and, and into the, the cloud, but it could be from the control systems as well. Uh, to, to get information from lift pump stations and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and all that information goes into actually creating the model. Richard. So are you performing all of your analytics in the cloud or are you doing any type of bench uh, computing? Uh, right now, it, it's, uh, it, it's uh, 
in the cloud, uh, but we're, we actually have a bit of a hybrid model because uh, uh, the amount of computing that we're actually using is, is cost prohibitive to actually do it all in the cloud. Uh, edge computing, uh, it's funny you should mention that, I was going to bring it up, but uh, it's something that uh, we're investing a lot of R&D in. Uh, because uh, you're exactly right. Uh, the, the amount of, uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, it, uh, the, the 40 coal mine, for instance, they really wanted to have, to have it completely autonomously operated by, by 2050. Well, they're going to have to have data centers on site. So there's no latency in terms of the, the computing power to run the AI uh, algorithms to, to actually run the, the actual operation. That's true edge computing, and so so we we uh, we're talking to a couple of companies. We've got a couple of things on the go, and uh, and we know that that's that that's the future. So yes, you know we're yeah, we're actually about. pushing it down, which is called quad computing down the sensors, where they've got arm chips and doing some of the analytics on the uh, sensor itself to it's really to minimize uh, the backhaul for all that data and also lower the latency. Yeah, yeah. So, so a distributed computing model as well is, is the is is definitely the way to go. So, you, you can have uh, some some of the information actually pre-processed uh, before it actually gets into the cloud, uh, and even when it gets to the cloud, you can have something like uh, stream analytics uh, before it actually the data is even stored. Uh, so, so there's different levels of information that can be collected and different levels of of understanding of that information that it can be collected along the way. And, and that's that's something that's uh, that, that's becoming a reality now. So it used yeah, to be cool. just used to be just dumb sensors yeah. in, in the field collecting uh, you know ohms or, or volts or milliamps or whatever the case is, and sending that information may have to make sense of it from a data a central data source. Now uh, somebody uh, potentially with a with a you know, Bluetooth uh, application on their phone can, can collect a, a real time information that gives them exactly what that sensor. Is, is actually reporting uh, on, on their phone, and, and, they, and the, the actual computing power or, or the, the translation of that information is done by a microprocessor right attached to the actual sensor. Yeah. Last question, and then we'll um, yeah. wrap up. Yeah, so I've seen a lot of challenges with uh, distributed computing uh, in cloud. You know, how do you secure those networks? IoT devices, how do you secure those networks? Uh, so, can you? You know, speak about some case studies or challenges you have faced and how you have resolved. Well, the um, uh, security is always a concern. All, all the information we have and all the networks that, uh, well, sorry, I, I should rephrase that. All the networks that we built from from sensor into into cloud into application, the, the data is encrypted the entire way through. Uh, that's not the case with, with, with a lot of <laughs> hardware companies. A lot of hardware companies, it just sort of is broadcast. And, and uh, uh, the idea is that uh, it, since there's no personally identifiable information, and uh, it, nobody's really going to care about how much water there is in a sewer, that, that, that they don't really care too much about it. Uh, our view on that is that every Things should be encrypted, so all data should be uh, secure. So, so the, the systems that we're actually building from uh, from from the ground up, so to speak, uh, it, it's all secure um, through throughout it, right, right into the, uh, the actual cloud. So, is there some tools you can uh, allow that you know, how do you secure IoT devices because there's no security on the chip? You know, if there's small sensors, how do you secure the uh, data transmission? Well, well, the the sensors themselves uh, typically are are cryptic in terms of their uh, the, the you're talking about the sensor to the actual microprocessor. Or are you are you? Yeah, you. That could be a small, maybe a Raspberry Pi. It's a small thing in the CPU. So if you could be transferring that data from the sensor to the cloud, how you are securing? Well, it, it, it's it's encrypted, so we we have sort of. A, uh, an encryption layer that uh, that in the case of the stuff that we built, I should make sure I put that qualifier on because a lot of companies don't do that. But uh, what we do is we encrypt the data, so, so uh, data comes up into the network. If it's a low power network that uh, that we have, sort of a lower design or something like that, you know, it comes in as, as an, an encrypted form and it's decrypted once it reaches the uh, the, the, the lower stack and transferred into. Uh, our, our application stack.
Does that make sense? Yes, so I think you are, your software is encrypting, you are putting some clients on the IoT devices, so how you are doing it? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so the, the the encryption actually is is on is 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 programmed in the firmware on the microprocessor, but it's actually attached to the sensor. So, so the um, uh, so the transceiver that, that's on that's attached to the microprocessor that's attached to the sensor is in sending encrypted information up into the actual network, and then it's decrypted once it reaches their stack. I can't go further than I've gone into that. I, I'd have to get one of our, our mechanical or electrical uh, engineers to speak to that exactly on, on what protocols we're using <coughs> and, 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 uh, and, and how it's being done, but I, I, can, I can tell you that that's what we're, we're building in because no matter what the data actually is, we feel that uh, in the future that everything needs to be encrypted and secure. No, no, even if it's even if it's water and sewer, right? So. All right, great. Let's give Greg. Uh, Greg. Okay, so Greg will be here. So if you'd like to come up and ask him uh, more detailed questions or uh, you know have a, a round table here, uh, he's uh, will stay. We have a room till ten thirty. So. Uh, the people that uh, you heard earlier, uh, be sure to, to reach out and connect with people uh, so we can start uh, building uh, relationships and opportunities here for us in the area.